This is a uh, stewardship message. <laughs> You're all say, oh, why did I come today? I have to fight the traffic, and then I have to listen to a stewardship. Well, I tell you, this is... I won't be mentioning finances till toward the end, but, you know, I got to thinking about it, and I, I have typically done um, stewardship messages where I go through all of the different ways we're stewards and then ultimately get to finances, but it's almost easier just to do finances because I really do try to do stewardship all through the year. I mean, that's just part of, uh, uh, of the message of Christ, so, uh, but there will be a focus uh, toward the end. First of all, I want to read from 1 Kings 17, beginning with verse 1. 1 Kings 17, verse 1. And I won't read all of that that I have written in your bulletin, but, or in your outline, but let me just read, oh, well, I'll just read till I stop. How's that? <laughs> After a long time, this is 1 Kings 18, I'm sorry, 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in, in the Kareth a ravine east of the Jordan. And you will drink from the brook, and I, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did. He did exactly what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. He stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Seraphath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Seraphath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. We can stop there because I'll pick it up as we go along. I have... Oh, one other thing I wanted to say that I've missed for two weeks, and that is... Uh, Borden doesn't have that wheelchair anymore. He's, he's starting to walk with a walker, and pretty soon he's going to be dancing without anything. So, <laughs> Sorry, I should have said that two weeks ago, but I kept, just went, just drove right past. I have at home, or someplace, a pen and pencil set. I've kept that in a drawer for 60 years. Sometimes I take it out and look at it. Uh, why would I keep it for 60 years? Well, it's a fine writing instrument. Okay, that's right. Uh, the brand is a good brand. I used to think maybe it was an expensive brand. I'm not sure that it was. Maybe Eversharp. You remember that brand? Uh, I think one of them is, what do you call it? A uh, fountain pen. Uh, we don't have fountain pens much anymore, do we? Although sometimes, okay. No, it wasn't any of those reasons. It was one of the last items that came into my possession when my father, when he passed away in Veterans Hospital in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Occasionally through the years, I would come across that pen and pencil set and from my dad. Now think about the 10 years I had with him wondering what it would be like to learn how to be a dad from a dad. Why do I keep these? Well, one day, not long before my mother died, I, for some reason, had that pen set out, and I think I raised some questions about it, and her response went something like this. Oh, that? Eh, I think somebody may have picked that up in the gift shop. Maybe sort of insinuating that maybe Dad didn't have anything to do with it all, probably. Huh. I thought that was a little bit insensitive, although I don't think she realized what she was really saying to me, and there's not much that takes my breath away. You won't tell me anything that shocks me or surprises me about you or anyone else. I've been around too long. But you know what? That took my breath away. It really did. And reminded me that you cannot put full trust in anyone or anything except Jesus. Even with the best of intentions, we often hurt each other, we fail each other, and we fail God. No one here, there's no one here that has not failed God. I used to think I was a pretty good judge of character, but I've lived long enough to see that nobody's perfect, even the best of my friends and family. I'd like to say that to you, and, and I think I can honestly say, you can always trust me, I will never let you down, 
And I would mean that. And you know me well enough to know that I would mean that. And it's good advice. But let me give you some better advice. Put all your trust only in Jesus, not in anyone else. Because somebody, maybe everyone, sooner or later, if you pay close attention, will let you down. Now, you might not understand what's happening in your life, and you may say life isn't fair, but through it all, God is there when you go through these really tough times. And I've talked with people about that this very week. Some of the problems, some of the things that they've gone through are just horrible. Trust Him. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Now, we need to understand what God has to say to us and to the family about trust. And if you don't trust God, and you probably don't believe in God, you may say, I don't know if I trust Him, but I believe Him. No, you don't. You don't really, down, way down deep inside, you don't really believe there exists a God if you don't trust Him. So we begin in 1 Kings 17, where without introduction, Elijah explodes on the scene. He has not a, a, appeared anywhere in Scripture before that time. He simply emerges, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe. And he steps right in the middle of the greatest spiritual crisis the nation of Israel has experienced in years. The wicked king Ahab and the even more wicked queen Jezebel have led the people of Israel into Baal worship, and Baal was the Canaanite god of fertility and rain, and the result was rampant sexual immorality, theological heresy. In fact, in 1 Kings 16, it says that Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of the kings that preceded him. Imagine being the worst president in history, mm. the worst pastor in a church, the worst employee at your business. He is the worst, most idolatrous, most unfaithful, sinful king in Israel's history. And so judgment is about to fall, not just on Ahab, but unfortunately on Israel as well. And in the time of great crisis emerges the prophet Elijah, and God uses the prophet to call the people back to himself. Now, here's how he does it. In the ancient world, especially in Israel, rain was essential to life itself. Okay, well, it is everywhere, isn't it? I mean, the crops would fail, there would be no harvest, probably the livestock would uh, die, the people simply couldn't survive. That's why Baal, or Hadad, there's another name for Baal, was a constant temptation to the people. He was the god of rain, he was the storm god, and whenever a drought began to emerge, it was easy for the people to abandon their god, the only god, the god of their fathers, in favor of, hey, this new god over here, he's a god of rain. Maybe we should get us a little, you know, a little uh, statue of him and, and pray to him. See how that works. And God says, you know, you want to see rain? You want to, you want to, you, you want to see the God of rain? Hmm. You want to know who's really in charge of rain? You want to know who really controls the weather? Okay, if you insist. And for three and a half years, not one drop of rain falls on Israel, and it became the dust bowl of the ancient world, and the result is eventually the people repented. They gave up their worship, their worship of Baal. They discovered the truth. Uh, the people returned to the true God, God's fickle people. The regime of Ahab and Jezebel ultimately is destroyed. The power of God prevailed and the nation is saved. But along the way, as always happens, some innocent people have to suffer for the sins of their leaders. And that's exactly the picture we see here. In 1 Kings 17, 7, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now, this is the brook where God has sent Elijah to live running from Jezebel. And we're told in verse 5 that God sent Elijah to the Kareth Ravine. Why? To get fresh water, plus apparently it was safe there. And by this time, Elijah is public enemy number one. Je Jezebel makes sure of that. He hates, she hates this guy. Uh, now in verse 7, it says the brook dries up. God sent him to a brook. It dried up. In verse 8, the word of the Lord comes to him, not before the crisis, but in the crisis. Have you noticed uh, God doesn't always tell us about the crisis ahead of time? Sometimes we do have a sense of God's presence telling us something, warning us about something, but no one in the Bible has a two-year plan or a five-year plan. God doesn't reveal his will until we need to know his will. And, and sometimes when he speaks, we question his advice and we question his commands, as perhaps Elijah probably did. And God says, Verse 9, go at once to Seraphath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Now, why might he question that? 
I mean, was there any good reason? I mean, Seraphath was a commercial trading center in the Mediterranean coast, but more importantly, it was the center of Baal worship. Now, these people were the very idolaters whose worship has plunged Israel into ruin, and Elijah is to take up residence where the heresy started, and besides, it isn't, it isn't uh, raining there either. It's dry. It doesn't make any sense. God doesn't always make sense to us. To make matters worse, the king of Phoenicia, whose headquarters was in Seraphath, happened to be, the king, happened to be Queen Jezebel's father. God is telling Elijah to leave the ravine where at least he's safe from Ahab and Jezebel and go to live where her father is king. And remember, he's public, Elijah's public enemy number one. In the ancient world, a widow had no social or economic standing. Her husband is dead. Apparently, she has no family to depend on. She has no job, no, no means of support. She can't get a job. She is the person least likely to survive the drought. So God is sending the prophet to the Mecca of Baal worship, to a place where the drought mirrors the drought in Israel, to, to the headquarters of the enemy, to be sustained by a widow that is about to starve to death. I wonder if that makes any sense. Did it make sense to Elijah? I don't think so. So what did he do? He went to Seraphath because he trusted God. He traveled 90 miles on, on foot through the jurisdiction of Ahab and Jezebel to Zarephath. When was the last time you walked to uh, Fort Lauderdale? Not lately. No matter what Elijah may have thought about God's plan, he was obedient. It was his obedience that led to his survival, ultimately to the survival of the widow and her son and the entire nation of Israel. We have no way of knowing how our obedience today may affect our tomorrow. Sometimes we can look back and we can see how it, it did affect, either negatively or positively, whether, whether or not we actually were obedient. Oh, it's just a coincidence, you know. The minute you arrive at the city, there's that very person. If, if you read that in the Bible... The very minute he arrived in Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> there just happens to be that very person picking up sticks. That's a coincidence. What a coincidence. Now listen, a coincidence is when God prefers to remain anonymous. She's gathering sticks to make a fire to cook some food, and Elijah calls to her, and he says, and we read this in verse 10, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called and bring me, please, a piece of bread. He's hungry, he's thirsty, he's not being bossy or disrespectful, but he, he is in a position where he's always had authority. And so he just asked, and this is the woman that's going to provide for his needs. Now, a little surprise, maybe, to, even to him in verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour and a jar and a little oil and a jug. And I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. That's his rescuer. Hmm, oh boy, that's great. He's supposed to be cared for by a widow and she's about to starve, so things are really shaping up nicely. Have you ever felt that way? Probably, sometime. God gives Elijah a message. Listen. Elijah gives the widow the message, and God gives all of you the same message. Verse 13, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. No matter how difficult your circumstances may appear, don't be afraid. God will make a way. Elijah said, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have, and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said, The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Next Sunday you'll hear a miracle just about that exciting. Verse 15, So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. So how is this miracle relevant to me? What does it say to us, our circumstances in the 21st century? Well, let me just make some suggestions. First of all, 
Number one in your outline, examine your spiritual health. This was at its root a spiritual problem, you understand. It was a lesson. God was using the drought to call the people to truth and to repentance. I struggle with the idea that God sometimes causes difficulty and pain. And yet there are places in the Bible, a few, not a lot, but there are some places in the Bible where he actually does that to teach people a lesson. On the other hand, I'm confident that he, he permits difficulty, and I'm certain that he uses difficulty. Whether it's something that is your fault, you created the mess, and you find yourself now in it, or you're innocent and you did nothing to deserve this drought, but here is this problem you're in. The right first step is always to ask yourself, what is God saying to me? What is God's plan? What is God's purpose? What am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to change? Someone said, if you, cannot, uh, if you want to, to, to see what's in a bottle, shake it up. <laughs> and I, maybe, you know, I would build on that and say, if you want to see what's in a man or a woman, shake them up a little bit, and we'll, we'll see what comes out. You know, there, there are 500 verses in the Bible on faith. And there are about 500 verses on prayer, but there are 2,000 verses dealing with money and possessions. Now I'm edging toward that a little bit. You know, God uses money and possessions to show us who we are, to reveal the true nature of our spiritual health. Henry Ford once said, money doesn't change men, it merely unmasks them. Fred Smith, founder of the FedEx, I love to hear Fred, I remember going to hear him speak one time, uh, he's, a, he, he's a great Christian communicator. He says, uh, he, maybe he's deceased now, I'm not sure, but he says, God gives us money to test us as you give a toy to a child to prepare him to handle things of greater value later. So, where are you today spiritually? Are you more concerned about the stock? You probably are, about the stock <laughs> more than your soul or the bottom line more than integrity. Are you more worried about your possessions than you are about people? Are you anxious or are you trusting? Are you worried? Are you at peace? Now, maybe we need to do some spiritual introspection. Have all the issues in your life been settled, whatever that may be? Does God take first place in your life? That's, that's really all we're seeking to do is allow God to take first place in our lives. Use your circumstances to examine your spiritual health. And you just say, God, use those circumstances to teach me, to lead me, to improve me, to prepare me, to purify me. Uh, he uses circumstances to get our attention. So that's number one, examine your spiritual health. Number two, choose to rely on God. That's what Elijah did. He, he could have refused to go to Seraphath. He could say, look, God, it's not safe over there. You know that. Did I misunderstand you? He could have fled Seraphath in search of food, but he chose to obey and trust and to rely on God. We live in a, in a really materialistic, self-sufficient culture. You know that the annual self-storage revenue in the United States is $39.5 billion. That's like many warehouses um, to store stuff that you probably may not ever go back and even look at. It's just, yeah, I don't want to get rid of that. Now, it borders on absurd unless you happen to own the storage facilities. Now, that's another thing. David McNeil has a collection of world-class automobiles. The most expensive acquisition was in 1963. Ferrari 250 GTO for a mere $70 million. To sit in his garage. I mean, probably one for your collection, Jack, wherever you are. I don't know where Jack is. He's out there someplace. Um, now, I don't covet David's collection or his right to have classic cars, but when I see that, you know, we've become so materialistic. I, I, I uh, had something in my Bible that I had put in there the other day. First silver dollar struck by the U.S. Mint, seen by George Washington, maybe Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson. Be worth a couple of dollars, probably. In fact... It was just sold for a mere $12 million. I mean, that's cool. I mean, you just get this little, little item and put it in a box and hide it in a safe and, until you die, and it's worth $12 million. Well, you know, that's cool. I mean, it is really in a sense, but uh, 
financial, you're financially set or you're struggling to pay the bills or you're living comfortable, comfortably, we still have to choose to rely on God because you can't always fix your marriage and you can't solve your children's problems and you have unexpected financial issues and you can't always fix your health. And I will tell you right now, I did it my way is not a song that you should identify with. I like God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I choose to rely on God. That brings me to number three, partner with God. Remember the passage in Philippians 4 where we're told we can count on or trust God? It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. What an incredible passage of Scripture. God promises to meet all my needs. Really, if you go to another place in the Bible, he'll meet most of your wants, actually. Maybe not all of them, but he'll meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And yet, of course, we pray, and sometimes our prayers aren't answered. I know that. I was thinking... I'll probably bring up something tender here for some of you, but God is sovereign. I I, I remember praying for Juanita, Richie's sister, for three years, and you did too. And for a while I thought, he's going to fix that problem. And he did fix it. She's happier now than she's ever been in her life, but the family had to struggle with all of that. And yet we know that God is sovereign. So you've examined your spiritual life, you choose to rely on God, and intentional, deliberate choice. You've made that decision. Now, what's the next step? The next step is to partner. Number three is to partner with God. And I'm just saying, cooperate with God. Does it it strike you as ironic that God tells this widow to make bread out of the flour and the oil he's going to provide? These are some of the questions I have. If God could provide flour and oil, couldn't he have just provided a, a loaf of Wonder Bread or some nice potato bread? I like that. But all through the Bible, God has this partnership with us. God's going to flood the world, but he wants Noah to build an ark. God is even going to bring in all the animals two by two, but Noah still has to build the boat. God is going to part the Red Sea, but Moses has to hold a stick over it. And God is going to destroy the city of Jericho, but the children of Israel have to march around it day after day. And Jesus is going to feed thousands of people, but the disciples have to obtain this little boy's lunch to make it happen. And God is going to give us the Word of God, the Bible, the Scripture, But men have to write it down, and other men will spend years determining what is really the inspired canon of Scripture. Always there's a partnership with God. As we work, God works. We use the gifts and the abilities and the opportunities that He's given us, and as we obey Him, God does what we cannot do. So, let's say we've done a spiritual spiritual self-examination, and we are partners in ministry and we will rely on God in all circumstances. Now, let me take you into this financial realm for a minute. Number four is be faithful in all circumstances. Now, let's go back. You've heard me say it. Let's see if you remember two simple questions when we talk about stewardship. The first one is, anyone remember? You will after I give you the first one. Can I trust God? Did anybody get that? Did you remember that? Can I trust God? All right, let's see. Can I trust you? Okay, I think we agree. Yeah, well, uh, we have had some pretty unpleasant circumstances, but life isn't always fair, but it seems like God has been faithful. His, His care is pretty constant. Okay, okay, I trust you, God. Ah, but there's another question. What's that? Can God trust me? I'm sorry, Lord, probably not. But we make an effort. You need to be faithful and financially, financially, in every way, but financially, no matter what your, uh, your circumstances, no matter what your situation. If anybody in the Bible is an exception, I wonder who that would be. Would that maybe be a little woman and her son who are on the verge of starvation? Probably. But she gave the first cake of bread to the prophet. You remember the first tithe and offering? Anybody remember the first tithe? Who was that? Rob knows. I should ask Rob to to explain it. What's his name? Well, okay, but I was thinking of the other name. It was to whom? Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the mystery man of the Bible. 
If anybody knows anything about Melchizedek, come over to our Bible study because that's one of the mysteries of the Bible. But Rob could probably, he could probably give you a pretty good lecture on it. Okay. I don't know if the widow was familiar with the words of Proverbs 3.9, but it says uh, that we are to honor the Lord by giving him the first fruits. Now we're talking finances. When the economy goes south and when we take a hit in the stock market and when we lose our job or our position, that's when you discover your priorities. How faithful are you to God financially in the lean times? Are tithes and offerings a part of your faith and worship or a kind of, I guess I should do my duty if I have enough to pay all the other bills first. So being faithful during a difficult time is the opportunity to discover how deep and wide our riches are. Now Martin Luther says, I've held many things in my hands across my life. I've lost them all. Only that which is placed into the hands of God do I still possess. I was looking at my granddaughter. She's almost upside down here, and I was like, who is that? Uh, you should sit up straight, okay? <laughs> uh, okay, the novelist John Gresham said, my wife and I measure the success of each year by how much we've been able to give away. Now, I want you to understand, God is the great provider. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. So, we have to examine our spiritual health, choose to rely on God, partner with God, be faithful in all circumstances, and number five, we must be financially faithful. Now, when we're faithful, we position ourselves to receive his fullness and his miraculous gifts. And when I talk about finances, you know me well enough to know it's just like inviting someone to a special service. I'm not trying to fill a pew. I don't care that much about filling a pew. If I tell you, I wish you'd come and hear this particular person, it's because I'm interested in you, and I really want you to enjoy this, and I want you to... That's the way I feel. It's not about, you know, whatever. That's kind of the way I feel about giving. It's not about... I've even told people, if, if the only thing you can do is give it to another church because you think I somehow am interested in your money, then go give it to another church. But learn the process and the principle of giving. So, I've understood that since I was a child. Oh, I got three minutes. Okay, here's... <laughs> Here's a dollar, Bobby, you should give eh, 10 cents. Or here's, a, here's, a, here's a $10, Bobby, you should give a dollar. Well, mom and dad never made me do it. They just told me what I should do. In the early years of our marriage, when money was tight, and I knew if I honored God with my tithe check uh, at that right time, it might occasionally bounce. So I could have said, well, I just don't have it this week, God. But instead of, of doing that, I would... Uh, write the check, and I would throw it in the desk drawer, put it in when I knew it was covered. Ultimately, I was obedient. But I've wondered since how many blessings I missed by not being able to see God at work and what he would have done with that if I had put it in, where the money would have come and covered. And you say, well, you're just a bad business fellow. Well, maybe, or maybe I just lacked faith. Ultimately, I did pay my tithe, but probably the most pointed command in the Bible regarding tithes and offerings is recorded in Malachi 3, where God accused Israel of robbing him. And the people said, uh, you say what? Robbing you? What are you talking about, God? How are we robbing you? And God responds, you are robbing me by not bringing to the temple and the priest the traditional tithes and offerings. And he goes on to say, this is Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now the storehouse is the local church. It's not Dave Jeremiah, Charles Stanley, or Bobby Shuler, although I like all those guys, but the tithe is the first 10%, and then whatever you want to give beyond that, send it to Bobby. By the way, I respect all these guys, I really do. But the first 10% is storehouse giving. Okay, now place, pay close attention to the next verse. Because you can search the Bible from Genesis to the maps, and you will not find a passage where God says so specifically. Verse 10. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room enough for it. That would be disgusting to get all those blessings and not have room for it. Well. And then he goes on to describe how he will bless them if they are faithful in giving. See, 
this wasn't just a, a, a nation of finances, you know, money, money, money. This was a lot of bartering. Uh, they, they, they raised their crops. They traded, all of that. So this is, this is what he says. He goes on to describe how he's going to bless them. Verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit. You see, most of us are not farmers. We don't have a, a corn or, or, or hogs or vineyard. We're not vineyard keepers. It's just a model. It's a principle. But the principle remains the same. Now you go to Proverbs. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Well, then somebody says, hmm, pastor, that's Old Testament stuff. Yeah, that, was, that worked then. Support your thesis with New Testament. Oh, I'm glad you asked me. You ask me that every time I preach this. So anyway, I'm glad you asked. Luke, this is the New Testament. Give, and it will be given you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you again. I wouldn't say I don't care, but the whole point is I, I don't want your money. I want you to learn how to worship the way God called you to worship. I don't know who gives what in this church. That's why it's easy to, to preach, because you can't say, well, he must have looked at the bottom line. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's, 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 a, uh, it's something that we all need to learn. The Catholic Church typically gives 2%, and the Protestant Church typically averaged 3%. So the churches, most church, a lot of church people aren't giving 10%, but then there are, a lot of, there are people in the church that give 15% or 20%. So maybe it balances out, but the blessing comes to those who give cheerfully. Um, not, oh, shoot, i got to do this again this Sunday. <laughs> no. So... There are actually two principles at work here. I believe all this, by the way. I'm not making it up, okay? In the Old Testament, God says, if you're faithful to me in a financial way, I'm going to bless you and prosper you. And in the New Testament, Jesus says, yes, if you're faithful to me in a financial way, I'm going to bless you and prosper you, but you're the one that sets the standard that I will use in blessing and giving back to you. It's the same old thing. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you reap generously. So just decide how much, what you want to reap and sow on. So Elijah the prophet, I do believe this with all my heart. I, 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 it's not really too difficult to preach because I, I hope you understand that it's, it's for your benefit, it's not for my benefit. It's all about being faithful to God. And uh, if God tells you you don't have to do it, then that's fine. You, you, that's between you and the Lord. <laughs> But Elijah the prophet and, and this unnamed widow discovered that in the crucible of suffering, in the direst of circumstances, in the good times and in the not-so-good times, if we trust God, if we are trustworthy, God will make a way. And that's what we're going to sing in our closing song. It became one of my favorite songs, along with two or three others, because of some of the struggles that we went through years ago and discovered God will make a way where there seems to be no way. So uh, if you'll stand together, and uh, Jen will come and lead us in that. Let me just ask uh, a blessing, or actually have a prayer this morning. Father, thank you uh, for the opportunity to share about stewardship. Uh, you expect, oh Lord, uh, for us to be faithful in every way. Help us. Maybe there are some who are trying to make decisions about that very thing. Help them, Lord, to be faithful uh, to you. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. And, and for your faithfulness and for your many promises, uh, bless now our, our church family as they leave this place in Jesus' name.